Alright guys, welcome along to Nebulous Fleet Command. How's the volume there, troubleshooter? <clears throat> yeah? Okay. <clears throat> to me, the music is a bit loud, but uh, I'm sure it'll all pass. Right, been waiting a while for this one to come out. Kind of more realistic space combat, um, from what I've seen, expanse like. And uh, yeah, we'll get right into it and learn the basics. There is a warning that comes up, it says it can be overwhelming if you don't go through the basics, and I would definitely imagine that from what I've seen. But uh, yeah, <laughs> from the Alliance system of Emmet time, Bradford Naval Academy's first step. In the naval careers of fresh officers, learning lessons and lengthy practical trials are held to shape future spacers into officer material. Cool. <coughs> so, right, we have two friendly ships. Okay. So I haven't gone into skirmish mode, haven't gone into anything. I want to go in fresh. Uh, welcome to Bradford Commander. Uh, I'm Lieutenant Hazel and I've been assigned as your instructor to get you up to speed with the command interface of your warship. Lieutenant Meadows was reassigned to train pilots and carrier commanders, so I'll be guiding you through your standard trials. There. Yeah, so we're getting familiar with the controls. Commander, I'm Lieutenant Hazel. I'll be guiding you through the trials to determine if you're cleared for operations. The brass has their eyes on you, so try not to embarrass me. Okay, that's that's loud. I think we'll bring everything down and then we can bring that back up a little bit. That was very loud. Let's get you familiar with the view controls first. Hold down the left mouse button and drag the mouse to angle your view. Now use the scroll wheel to zoom in and out. And most importantly, moving the view. Use W, A, S, and D to pan the view. E and C will raise and lower your view in the battle space, respectively. Okay. And that's it. Let's move on to the actual interface. We're going to select one of our ships now, so sit tight. You can select a ship either by clicking on its icon in the battle space, selecting it in the ship list, or pressing its corresponding number key indicated in the ship list. Yes, Commander. Oh, that's a little quiet. Receiving. Standing by. Awaiting your orders, Commander. Okie dokie. You've selected a ship. Now if you want to focus your view on the ship, you can use the F key. You can also do this by double tapping the ship's number key to both select and focus on the ship at the same time. When focused, your view will automatically track the selecting unit until you move the view. This guy has two turrets and he has the radar, right? And then he has the jammer and one turret and then a launcher. The launcher there. And then the launcher on this one is down there. Uh, yeah, so like homeworld style, right? This ship in particular is the Reigns class frigate. It's the most common warship in the fleets, with a generous balance of speed, agility, armoring, and some good room for a good mix of support modules and weapon systems. That seems to, it, that's not a blob, that's like your hull. So I wonder does that keep up with the damage? So you can see all the damage sections here. Like there's an in-depth damage model system. You'll also see at the bottom of the screen a readout of the selected ship. This is the ship information bar, and it's a list of the status of modules, weapons, current orders, and the general posture of the warship. This window is the damage control status board, and it'll be one of the most important items when in battle, as it shows the condition of all modules on the ship as a color gradient. Green means functional and undamaged, while red means heavy damage. A destroyed module or weapon is indicated in gray. 
Damage control is a whole can of worms, so we won't be covering that for now. Let's move on. <laughs> Next, the mount status display. This shows the status of all external mounts on the hull, which could be weapons, defense systems, or utilities. Okay, so you can't double click on them to move. Currently, all of our mounts show green with a black slash, indicating they're operational but idle. If you're ever confused at what a color or a symbol means, you can hover over the color status icon with your mouse to see what's going on. Lastly, we have the posture controls. These define how the ship will operate. From here, you can control maneuvers, which sensor systems are enabled, and toggle specific defensive systems. Cool. Right now, I've disabled most of these so we don't toggle something by mistake, <laughs> but we'll go over these systems later. So you know Trace. how the interface works, <clears throat> but what about issuing an order to a ship? The ANS Small Beginnings is reporting that their drives are online, so we'll get that frigate into a nearby position. Select the ANS Small Beginnings and open the action menu by right-clicking anywhere in the battle space. On the left side of the menu, select the Move or Movement submenu to see all available movement commands. The POS or Position command will order the warship to move to a position and hold there. Select Position and move the small beginnings within 500 meters of Waypoint Atlas. This is the dial widget, and it will allow you to accurately select a position on the plane the ship is currently on by moving the cursor. You can left click to confirm an order, or right click to cancel. To change the elevation, hold left control and move your cursor up or down. I think everyone's you can also issue waypoints by holding left shift and marking a path. The order will only be confirmed when left shift is released and you click again. Don't forget, if you need to get a better view, you can still hold the left mouse button to angle your view even while the dial is open. Oh, yeah, when yeah. you're ready, lay in a course for the small beginnings to position itself near waypoint atlas. Bit of a limit on the, the zoom, but okay. Yeah, you can see all the thrusters working to maneuver the ship. Homerly, yeah, but I like that. <clears throat> and then all of these ships can be outfit, tier standards. I want to get a real good look at the damage model, though. That's that's what it was uh, the thing that caught my eye on it. Kind of nexusy as well, you know, with the engines. I love that. <laughs> In the future, you can also use the M key as a shortcut to issue move to position orders. And retro thrusters. Another thing that I loved is that it has a workshop page straight off of early access. Say like, yes. Now let's talk formations. Because only one ship can be commanded at a time, formations are crucial for grouping your forces and keeping management simple. The ANS Dusty Tome is reporting they're ready for orders, so we'll have them fall in with the small beginnings. Select the Dusty Tome and open the action menu. The formation command can be found under the Move submenu and is issued with the FRM or Formation button. You can also use the keyboard shortcut Left Shift plus F key. We first have to designate a ship as the guide ship. This ship will be the actual leader for the formation, and all warships following the guide ship will try to copy their current orders. Select the ANS Small Beginnings to mark it as the guide. Next, you'll need to designate ah. a position for the Dusty Tome to take up information. The dial functions exactly like the movement command, but it's relative to the guide ship. Pick a position for the Dusty Tome to keep station on. The Dusty Tome will move into formation, and they'll try to follow the guide ship as best they can. If the guide ship is moving when the ship is ordered to form up with it, the guide will automatically slow down to allow the other ship to catch up. 
You can see the little indication there that he's in that formation now. You can have as many ships <laughs> as you want in a formation, but keep in mind that there are drawbacks to having a lot of closely packed ships beyond white knuckle helmsmen. Spacing is key, and sometimes you need to split up. Ships near each other create a larger radar return, making stealth and evasion more difficult and allowing the enemy to detect you at a longer range. But we won't go over sensor coverage just yet. <laughs> you can see the structure of your fleet and its formations in the ship list, which dynamically updates to show which ships are in formation with each other. Orders can be issued to your entire formation at once by opening the action menu in formation mode. This can be done by using left shift plus right click with any shift in the formation selected. What are our orders, Commander? The action menu will indicate it's in formation mode by displaying the number of ships the order will be delivered to. For formation mode, don't worry about which ship you have selected as the order will be delivered to all of them. Easier that way. Nice. Movement orders are a special case, as they will always be routed to the guide ship, and the whole formation will follow them. Makes sense. Now let's get the <laughs> whole formation moving in a direction. The Drive Course command, found on the Move submenu as the CRS or Course button, will order a ship or formation to travel in a certain direction indefinitely. Select the Drive Course command now. Do not issue the order just yet. When it comes to picking you directions excited. in space, you'll use the Sphere widget. It's similar to the dial widget from before, but allows for choosing directions more uniformly. Nice. It can be a little tricky at first, so take your time and get a feel for it. Moving your mouse cursor around will position the target on the surface of the sphere. By holding left control, you will log the direction and be able to change the radius. This is useful for weapons, as you'll see in a later lesson, but for choosing a course, we really only care about direction. Know that the cursor will remain on one side of the sphere, even if you pan the view. The initial size is determined by where your mouse was relative to the ship when you first opened the widget. If you need to switch the side, hold left control and draw the radius back through the center until it's on the opposite side. Are Get some practice sure moving that? the cursor around now, as selecting a direction or position in 3D space can be very disorienting at first. When you're ready, issue the order to get the formation underway in the given direction. Formation on a course will go like that. The formation will now drive the course until told to do otherwise. Careful not to lose attention and let them get too far. We've had an incident in the past and I'm not going to fill out more paperwork. Lastly, let's break the dusty tome back off from the formation. To do so, all you need to do is select the ship and issue a standard movement order to it. That will override its order to keep in formation. Well, congratulations! That completes your first lesson in maneuvering ships in the battle space. We'll cover more advanced topics like weapons employment and tactical view in the next lesson. I'll see you back at the academy. Alright, yeah, very homeworldly, but that's that's a good thing. But will land automatically in 30 seconds. We're ready whenever you are. Falling into formation. Waiting orders. So like, is that the bridge? Oh, that's fun. Okay. Right, weapons. <clears throat> From the interface, weapons control is as simple po as point and click. Well, maybe not that simple, but it's easier than having to run a command down the line. Uh, Academy Command is all arise you for basic weapons trials. Now comes my favorite part, weapons and how to use them. 
Don't worry about that red contract over in the distance. It's a decommissioned frigate that's been tugged out here for target practice. Before we get to weapons, we need to learn about the tactical view. You can switch between tactical and normal views by pressing spacebar. Oh, where have we seen that before? <laughs> The view controls here are the same as before, but you can zoom out much further and get a better idea of the situation in the battle space. Take a moment to look around now. Standing by. No reading here. Standing yeah, so by. you can see how that could be huge in a large battle. Like The tactical view provides you with a lot of information that you wouldn't be able to get otherwise. It's your primary way of knowing what's happening around you. You'll be using it a lot. The range plane shows you both elevation of targets and their distance from a given point. When no ships are selected, it sits at the center of the battle space. Select the small beginnings now to see how the plane changes. That's with nothing selected. Take note that the range plane moved to center on that ship. It'll also track with it. All ranges will be indicated relative to your currently selected ship. Notice that the line from the enemy track to the range plane has a slight curve. This is because elevation and range are not directly related, so the contact's distance on the plane must be projected onto the sphere. So yeah, it's, it's not just a straight line up from where it is, it's an actual distance. This layout makes it easy to determine the range of a target by looking at the position of the plane relative to your selected ship's capabilities. The dotted lines represent maximum ranges of your ship's systems. Red indicates offensive range, blue is sensor range, and defensive systems are green. While there are common ship configurations found throughout the fleet, most ships have some unique capability. The ANS Small Beginnings is configured with two Mark 62 twin barrel 120mm cannons and a 16 cell vertical missile launcher. I'm unlocking your weapon systems now, <laughs> so let's put gunnery to the test with some tried and true naval fire. There are several ways to target weapons. The fastest and simplest is by shooting directly at the sensor track. To do this, right click the red sensor track to bring up the action menu in track mode. The action menu will indicate it is in track mode by displaying the targets and track number in the space. It will automatically open the weapons list if there are any weapons on the ship. The active targeting mode is shown at the top of the list. Right now we are in track mode indicated by TRK. We'll talk about other modes later. Select the cannons from the weapon list and light up the target. Firing on that target. <laughs> Definitely seeing some hits there. Looking good. If the guns can't hit a target, the ship will automatically roll itself to get currently active weapon on angle on the target. This is called unmasking. Right now you'll notice that our fire is pretty inaccurate. This is because our targeting solution isn't using a fire control lock. The red dot jumping around near the track shows where our sensors think the target is. Ah. Let's improve our targeting accuracy by locking the target with our bullseye fire control radar, located on the top of the ship. To do this, right click the track and select the LCK, or lock, at the top of the action menu. You can also use the X key keyboard shortcut. Gotcha. Notice the new icon on the target. This indicates that the target is locked on and is providing much better accuracy and increased update rate on the target. Remember, not all ships have fire control radar, and you'll only be able to get a lock with ships that have them equipped. Right now we are shooting armor piercing, AP, shells at the target. Armor piercing is effective on armor plating, but will only deal damage to internal components directly in the shell's path once it punctures the hull. Okay, some proper ballistics. While any damage is a good thing, we can deal even more damage by switching the shell type to high explosive, dealing damage to a wide area in the target's internals. We use high explosive, HE shells, against targets of appropriate size or smaller, or larger targets with heavy armor damage. HE shells cause much less damage to armor, but penetration will explode inside and do damage to all nearby components and personnel. To switch to HE shells, first open the action menu in track mode by right-clicking the track.
In the weapons list, next to the cannons entry, click on the ammunition icon to open the ammunition list. Click the 120mm HE shell option to select it. The ammo switch is now pending and will only be executed if a new fire order is given. To begin firing the new ammo type, click the weapon group to confirm the ammunition change. You can see the color change as well. Now we'll select the small beginnings and watch what it's up to. The mounts display shows the ship's cannons are firing and cycling. When the yellow bar is filled, the cannon will fire again. We can also see that the fire control's radar is solid green, indicating it's active and it has an active lock-on. Yep. Yeah. Here's the active orders list, showing an icon for each order the ship is currently executing. Right now we have an order to fire our guns and an order to lock the target. Have the small beginnings hold fire and break their lock-on by right-clicking on the order icons to cancel them. And that's the basics of gunnery. The key thing is to know what <laughs> ammunition to use, especially as your target takes more damage to warrant the big stuff. But what if you don't have a sensor track? Take a look at your ship's hulls, and you'll notice the four white octagons on the sides. These are radar panels, and provide coverage for their respective sector of space. There's also a central control module inside the ship, which tracks what these panels see. When panels are damaged or destroyed, you'll lose coverage in that area. Similarly, if the radar controller is destroyed, you'll lose all coverage in all directions. Obviously, fighting blind is not a good thing. But that won't put you out of the fight just yet. Direct fire weapons like cannons can fall back on visual targeting, where the crew will provide targeting data to your guns using onboard optics. Some weapons like missiles can't do this, however. I've ordered your crew to disable the radar. Take a moment and observe what happens. You don't want the first time you're operating without radar to be the real deal. With sensors disabled, you will now mm. see visual contacts when you have one of your ships selected, and nothing when no ship is selected. Visual contacts are only useful to the ship that actually sees the target, unlike the sensor track, which was shared across all ships. Cool. If you don't see anything, you'll need to move within visual range, <laughs> about 3200 meters. I've created a marker in the general area for your reference. That won't happen in actual battle. But then we have small beginnings. Move to position there, roughly that way. You can fire on visual contacts the same way you did with the sensor tracks. Use visual targeting to fire at the target ship with the small beginnings guns again. Right, get in visual range. Yes. Gaining fire control solution. Firing on that target. Yeah, there's the hits that we delivered earlier. In a situation like this, you can imagine things are not going too well for you. But you'll at least still be a threat. So don't feel too cut up if your sensors go dark. Now missiles. The ships in this fleet carry two variants of the SGM-2 series anti-ship cruise missiles, the Thunderhead and the Hurricane. The Hurricane is a command-guided missile, which means it is guided to the target by a launching ship. If it misses the target, it will come back around and try again until it runs out of fuel, is shot down, or finally hits the target. Yeah, we're currently firing high explosive, bouncing off the armor, I guess. Command missiles are very difficult to avoid. The only way to defeat them without destroying the missile itself is by destroying the launching ship or jamming its sensors or communication. Shoot the archer, as we say. The downside is that the hurricane must be shot at a sensor track. If you lose a track, the hurricane will be useless. Let's launch three hurricane missiles at the target. Start by opening the action menu in track mode on the target. Now select the SGM-225 Hurricane with the weapons list. This will queue up a single missile shot at the target and leave you with an active track selection widget. Multiple missiles can be fired with a single order using the left alt key. Hold the left alt key and click on the target to add one more missile per click. 
The number of queued missiles is shown next to your mouse cursor. To issue the order, you can either click the left mouse button with the left ALT key released, or if you don't want to add another missile, you can press the ENTER key to submit as is. Missile away. Missiles are one of your most limited and precious resources, second only to the ships themselves. They are extremely powerful, but extremely scarce. You'll need to know when to use them, as it can't be replenished under normal circumstances outside of a port. Nice. That's damaged, you can see. Backing away. A frigate like the Reigns will be crippled by only two or three missile hits, but in a real fight, it will often take more than that to penetrate an enemy's point defense which are a serious threat to hurricanes as they tend to fly in a direct path. The ANS Dusty Tome is carrying a different missile loadout. Select the ship now so we can take a look at it. This frigate is carrying Thunderheads, an active radar guided missile, which means it carries its own method for finding targets, allowing it to seek targets by itself. It can be targeted in the same way as the hurricane missiles, but once it has left the tube, it's entirely autonomous. When it reaches the end of its path, it will activate its onboard seeker and begin searching for a target. Nice. The greatest benefit of active missiles is that they can be sent on complex waypoint paths, allowing for multi-angle strikes and even hitting targets behind asteroids. But we'll cover that when you get to your advanced missile trials. For now, let's just fire three Thunderhead missiles at the target as we did before with the Hurricanes. Once too clear. As easy as it is to use active radar missiles, there are some downsides to their operation. The first is that the missile must find a target within the cone of its seeker in order to track and kill it. Nice detail. This makes evasive maneuvers such as course changes an easy way to defeat active missiles fired at long range, especially against fast moving targets. The second shortcoming is that active seekers are easy to decoy with chaff and other countermeasures, meaning more missiles need to be used in order to score a hit as active missile radars are particularly sensitive to jamming and decoys. But that should do it for your weapons trial. I'll have Fleet Logistics retrieve the dummy ship, and I recommend looking into all the weapons when you get your chance. I'll see you at the Academy. Confirmed. Missile reserves are low. I bet they are. Oh, they're not going to hit in time. Missile count. <clears throat> okay, damage dealt 4,900. Right, damage control. <clears throat> damage control might seem to be a little bit below your pay grade, but trust me when I say that it's one of the most important trials to go through, especially when it comes to combat. Yep. All right, ready for something really nerve-wracking? <clears throat> for as long as you're out here in space, it's inevitable that you're going to take a few hits over the course of your career. In reality, the odds of us coming out unscathed in an engagement are exceedingly low. If you want to stay fit and combat effective, you're going to need to learn how to repair damage. Let's begin. To start, select the ANS Small Beginnings. I've had my boys set up some simulated scenarios for us to cover. Just stay cool, you'll start seeing some damage come up. For the purpose of this training exercise, I've just simulated damage in three of the Small Beginnings subsystems. Mount 1, the main radar controller, and the Combat Information Center. In the ship list, you'll notice a number of new icons have appeared. The orange number indicates the number of damaged components with active debuffs, which affects the performance of those damaged components. If there's a fire, it will be indicated here. 
Obviously, a fire in an enclosed space is a serious threat to ship survival. It'll slowly damage the ship over time. It'll also slow down the working speed of damage control teams. This red number indicates the components have been damaged to the point where they are no longer functional. This also includes components which have been completely destroyed. The red chevrons indicate the ship's command system are not operational, meaning they are no longer receiving any orders. Open the action menu to see what it looks like. The text of the center of the action menu will display not receiving when a ship can't receive orders. This is because the CIC, or Combat Information Center, has taken critical damage. You may have warships with backup command systems that allow maneuvering orders to be carried out while the CIC is disabled. This allows you to get your ship to safety and effect repairs. However, this ship isn't fitted with that. Going back to the ship's status display, we can see the damaged components and their locations. Ooh, I took that. <laughs> By clicking on the status display, we can open the damage control board. Do so now. The damage control board will show all of the components installed on the ship and their current status. You can use the filter buttons at the top to suppress things that you don't want to see. Connection restored. Your damage control officer will automatically prioritize repairs based on how important a component is. For example, your reactor and CIC are going to be priority one, as they're critical to the operation of the ship. If you have your own priorities, you can click on one of the items on the board to prioritize it manually. Prioritize items are highlighted in blue. Keep in mind that changing priorities frequently can cause teams to move around a lot, which wastes valuable time that could be used for repairs. You can actually see them moving around the ship as well, that's cool. Damage control teams are stationed in a DC locker and will move from there when damage is taken. It'll take time for repairs to start as the teams need to get themselves and their tools to the casualty. You can see the progress of the damage control teams by the gauge filling up on their token. Hazards like fires are their first priority, before they'll begin repairing actual damage, as these can deal damage over time. The important thing to remember is that once a component has taken damage below 90%, it can never be fully repaired back to 100%. Maximum repair is 10% more than the lowest integrity level the component had at the time of repairs. Okay, so you want to get things quick for the likes of a fire and so on. We'll let your teams work before we continue. Let's do two more drills. The first is a component restoration exercise. The CIC is now destroyed, with the integrity at 0%. Repair teams won't begin repairs to get it operational again, without you explicitly telling them to do so. You'll need to get it repaired. In the damage control board, find the CIC and use left shift plus left click to order your repair teams to start working on it. Once it's repaired, the ship will be able to receive orders again. This must be done manually, because restoring a component is a time and equipment intensive process. The equipment to do so is stored in the DC locker, and each locker only holds enough materials for one or two restorations. Okay, yeah, so we have one remaining. Although the CIC is disabled, and this ship can't receive orders to move or fire, you will always be able to prioritize damage control to attempt repairs. But this means that your repair teams are extremely vulnerable. They're moving into parts of the ship that are actively taking enemy fire, and could very well be killed. If all the personnel on a team are killed in action, you'll lose the team completely. If you run out of repair teams, you won't be able to repair at all. You can't replenish teams outside of a port, so keep that in mind. We'll wait for your teams to finish their work, then we'll continue. Did that not go through then? There, yeah, it didn't. I clicked on that, not that. see the bar filling up then. Do they manually move back or are they going to sit there? Can I move them back?
We read you. Now that the CIC is restored, the Small Beginnings is ready to receive orders again. After the teams reboot all of the computers, that is. Lastly, we'll do something a little dangerous, a catastrophic scenario. Most component damage is localized, and will only affect the part of the ship where the damage was received. On the other hand, catastrophic scenarios are situations which, left unchecked, will eventually take the whole ship down. These situations include reactor overloads, magazine explosions, and fuel line fires, just to name a few. I want to see a reactor overload now. Your repair teams will automatically move to prevent catastrophic damage, so there's not much you can do except watch. Just get a feel for what it will look like. Maybe not right now. Your damage control officer will always prioritize repairs for a situation like this. The ship's survival always comes first. Notice the flashing warning icon in the ship's list. Below the icon is an estimated countdown before the situation gets out of control. If you don't know what's wrong, you can hover over the warning icon to see a tooltip. Out of all of the catastrophic damage you might see, reactor overloads are the most deadly. Your teams know how to work with a damaged reactor, but fires and other hazards can make it a nearly impossible task to complete. Should the reactor go critical, you'll see a reactor bloom with a blast radius of about 1.5 kilometers. Standard doctrine states to move all of the friendly warships out of the danger radius of a ship with an impending reactor overload. Or send that ship towards the enemy? Be careful around enemy wrecks as well. Your weapons could have damaged the reactor housings, and you'll get little to no warning before they go off. Good to know. But Commander, that's it for your damage control trials. Just keep an eye on your teams and be smart about their movements and you'll come out just fine. Remember, the ship's survival always comes first. When the ship turns into a bomb, use it as a bomb. Yep. If we were already going to ram them, might as well ram them explosively. Good day to die and all that. Oh, the potential of this game. Hunters, let's go and do some electronic warfare. Don't waste your time. EOR is not simple, I could imagine. Neither is sensors. I could imagine this becomes a mess. Um, I'll have to it's get critical the log for you to that. understand your sensors and the things that affect them, as they act as your eyes in the battle space. After all, you can't shoot what you can't see. You like shooting stuff. But now it's time to learn how they actually work. How to evade detection while spotting the enemy, and how to fool your opponent is absolutely paramount to a successful engagement. Let's begin. Select the ANS Small Beginnings. Send traffic. The first thing we'll talk about is your signature size and methods of signature control. Active sensors like radar detect enemy ships by bouncing radio waves off of them. The physical size of your ship, combined with the angle of surface and the cross-sectional area from the viewing angle, affect the size of the returned energy. So to me, this is like it's a uh, bringing in elements of homeworld, like star sectors, sensors. In other words, kind of the same ship will appear on sensors at a longer range if its broadside is facing the enemy versus being bow on. Yeah, Small's radar off. cross section for the <laughs> Rain's frigate, for example, is from above and below the port and starboard stern. You can see the size of your signature by hovering over the signature summary on the ship information bar. There are other contributing factors to the size of your signature, including what modules are active and how many ships are nearby. Right now there is another ship nearby, which is boosting the size of the radar return and making it so the enemy can see us at a longer range. Safety overrides. Let's lower our footprint. Move the small beginnings more than 250 meters away from the dusty tome, so you won't contribute to each other's signatures. Don't move towards the enemy. We want to keep our current range. Take us in. 
If you hover over the signature summary with your mouse, you will see the nearby ship's modifier is gone, reducing our overall footprint. I ro rotate. Is that what burn through sweep is? Old heading, roll ship. Third force, move position, move position. Hmm. Now we're broadside on. It's good, but we'll need to do better if we want to hide ourselves from the enemy. On the ship list, the yellow icon indicates that the ship is spotted by the enemy sensors and is being tracked. Similarly, a red crosshair here would show that the ship is locked by the enemy's fire control radar. We have a good set of tools to reduce our radar footprint even further. Let's see what we can do to shake the enemy off. This switch will toggle our radar systems off, greatly reducing our footprint. This switch disables our communication suites, which can provide a modest reduction in our signature size. Go ahead and turn off both of these now, and see how it affects our signature size. <clears throat> so radar reduces it minus 25%. You may be surprised to see that even with your radars off, you are still seeing tracks. This is because the ANS Dusty Tome still has the radars and comms on and is transmitting tracks to the small beginnings, sharing their own data. Yes, yeah, so you can have one, like, sensor ship fighting in the others. Hover over signature summary with your mouse to see how changing these emission settings altered your signature. Down 34%. If you didn't move too close to the enemy, you'll notice the yellow icon indicating the ship is being tracked has disappeared. If you are still being tracked, it might be because your hull is at an angle that maximizes radar reflections. Even then, a lower signature size reduces the distance at which the enemy can detect you, even if you are well inside their maximum sensor range. Disabling emissions also has the added benefit of making you undetectable by passive sensors. Passive radar sensing is typically able to detect you 125% further away from your maximum radar range, so being invisible to it has an obvious benefit. Oh, you can do like... Okay. No, we don't want to do that. <laughs> Receiving. Don't know what that is. Understood. No, let's stop that. Okay. <clears throat> Sim lead. Wouldn't be a roller ship. All of this heading. Understood. We just want to see if we're at that range, or if we're well inside that range. Keep him on that heading until we give him a new order, probably. Is fair enough. <clears throat> the passive uh, radar sensing is typically able to detect you 125% further away than your maximum radar range. So being invisible to it has an obvious advantage. The downside, of course, is that turning off your radars means you <clears throat> can't detect threats as easily. Similarly, disabling comms means that the ship is no longer transmitting any tracks it sees to friendly ships in the fleet. Ships with their comms off will still be able to receive tracks from other transmitting ships, so they can act as a silent shooter. Nice. Go ahead and re-enable both the radar and the communications on the small beginnings. Now it's time to experience what having your sensors jammed feels like. Oh, fun. Confusing, right? Was that in both views? Yeah, wow. Well. 
That one then is still in range. Second target is gone. The enemy jammer is saturating our radar with radio waves, making it difficult for our systems to find legitimate contacts. This noise of contacts is what we are seeing, instead of the real radar picture. Notice that we lost track of the ship in front of us, but the one on the right is still clear okay. as day. This is because jamming only affects the area around the direction that is being jammed. Keep this in mind when you're trying to use jamming to protect your own ships. Even though he's jamming, we know he's in that direction. We do have a tool available that can be used in a pinch, the burn through sweep. Not all radar modules have this, but it allows for a short, high powered sweep in all directions. To execute the burn through sweep, open the action menu and select the BRN or burn through command on the top. Then, as quickly as you can, attempt to lock the target. You can use the X key for the lock on shortcut. Burn through sweeps will show a unique icon for detected targets, making it easier to spot the target through the noise. The icon will linger for about 30 seconds to give you time to lock on. Lock targets are much less susceptible to being lost through jamming. Acknowledged. Pretty sure we're locked on. Here we go. Heads up, they're jamming us. It uh, deselected it. the ship Most first. of the time you'll be able to maintain a fire control lock in spite of jamming. But keep in mind that jamming power stacks, so a fleet with enough jammers active at the same time will break any lock. Because burn through sweeps use a much higher power output, they also have the added benefit of being able to spot smaller, weaker contacts at a greater range. This is useful for finding small scout ships or approaching missiles. The downside is that the higher power output runs the risk of causing damage to the amplifiers every time you use it, so be careful not to burn out your radars. Oops. Your other option for burning through jamming is simply to get closer to the enemy, brute forcing your way in. Just try not to get sunk in the process. Jamming the enemy ourselves can be as easy as right-clicking their track and selecting our jammers with the EW weapons menu. However, these targets are far enough apart that they won't both be covered by the cone centered on only one of them. The ANS Dusty Tome is carrying a blanket radar jammer. We'll use that to jam both targets by catching them both in the jammer's cone of effect by targeting a position between both contacts. You can target a weapon on a position in space by opening the action menu by right-clicking in open space instead of on a track and use the sphere widget to target a position between the two contacts. Remember to use the tactical view, as it will give you precise bearings for positional targeting. And then control to change. No, that's a different radius. That's the wrong way, ah. Yeah. When in the tactical view, you'll see each track's position projected onto the sphere of the widget. To blind both of them, aim for a point between those two projected positions. Remember that you can change the radius of the widget by holding left control and drawing the radius in or out. And like that, they can't see us anymore, just like what happened to us. But they can also use the same tactics like burn throughs or approaching us to sift through the jamming. Even if you don't successfully jam the enemy's tracking of your ships, an active jamming signal will still reduce their sensor accuracy. This is particularly devastating for point defenses, which are shooting at very small, very fast targets and therefore require great accuracy. Using standoff jamming in coordination with your missile salvos will make them devastatingly effective. Let's try it. Fire off the missile salvo at the enemy ship ahead, and see how their defenses react with your jammer active. Receiving.
preparing for launch. Yeah, fired off five. I thought. I'll down shift, but obviously not. Well done, let's do that again. Launch confirmed. No, they're doing pretty good. Hey, maybe I should do the jamming again. What do you think? Maybe I should do that. Watch how radically the enemy defenses are firing. <laughs> point defense requires pinpoint precision, which your jamming is preventing by flooding their sensors with far too many false contacts. All right, now we get to see the difference, right? All part of the plan. When using jamming to cover a missile attack, You'll still need to watch out for airburst point defenses like flak guns, as they don't require much accuracy. Most importantly, the blanket jammer has a 90 second firing time. This is to prevent the amplifiers from overheating and being damaged. So he didn't see them coming in at all. Also a bit of friendly fire there, nice. However, there are times where you absolutely have to be able to use the system, or you'll lose the ship. In that case, you might not care whether the module destroys itself. This is what Battle Short is for. Ready. Select the ANS Dusty Tome if it isn't already. This is the toggle for the Battle Short mode. When this is on, all equipment safeties are disabled, and the equipment will continue to run until it destroys itself. Reserve it for emergency use. Or you'll hear an endless litany of profanity from the damage control officer. Probably won't, because it'll probably be dead. When Battle Short is enabled, active components with active duration timers will periodically be damaged. However, they will only begin taking damage when they exceed their normal firing time. One last thing to note is that most electronic warfare modules are single cycle systems. That means they won't repeatedly fire on the same target after their cooldown period. And you'll need to designate a new target every time the system comes off cooldown. Jamming is an extremely powerful tactic when used at the right time. Use it to cover your retreat, confuse enemy fire, cover your missiles, and anything else you can think of. With that out of the way, that should do it for sensors and E-War. I hope I made it easy to follow because the guidebooks on these are... nightmarish. I'll see you back at the Academy. Yeah, I'm going to sensor mode. Gotta use control to bring in the radius there. Then line it up roughly at the same height as them. I presume he's turning the yeah, up that. That's why he was up like that. Advanced maneuvers. Wrap up your movement trials with a quick rundown of other maneuvers taken straight from the handbook with a few of my own thrown in for good measure. Space is vast, Commander. There's usually no cover, 
And if you're lucky, you can see a threat coming kilometers away. Knowing how to move your ship is one thing, but knowing the right maneuver will make sure you come out on top. You can definitely make it out of a fight in one piece without using advanced maneuvers, but you'll see quite a good drop in repairs if you employ them correctly. <clears throat> Before we get started, let's order the Dusty Tome to enter formation with the small beginnings, so we can see how these commands affect other ships in the formation when issued to the guide ship. Stay about 300 meters away. I command assuming formation. Nice that he just goes over like that. Now let's try our first new command. Gotcha. Select the ANS <clears throat> Dusty Tome and open the action menu. Traffic. All of the commands we'll learn about in this lesson can be found under the Move submenu. The ALD, or Assume Lead command, will cause the formation that this ship is in to restructure itself with the selected ship as the new guide ship. Issue this order now. Hey Dark Maiden, this is Nebulous Fleet Command. Came out in early access yesterday. Been waiting a while for it. Uh, it's kind of like Expanse-like combat, much more realistic than you'd be used to seeing in some games. Homeworld-esque controls and hopefully a lot of depth. Customizability of ships. And yeah, still in early access, but it's uh, it looks very promising. Understood. It's not uncommon for the guide of the formation to come under fire first, as it's usually the most important ship, making it a prime target. Should it become disabled, its escorts will hold position around it. Um, at the moment, I think it's mostly tactical battles and multiplayer. I'm hoping like there's a dynamic campaign to it as well. That would be awesome. <clears throat> Sometimes you want them to hold the line, but there's other times that you need to sacrifice that disabled ship to save the others. When you have a large formation, the Assume Lead command will save you precious time reorganizing the formation around a new ship that can lead the survivors to safety. It's a lifesaver, literally. Since the Dusty Tome is the guide now, let's keep it selected and start covering the rest of the orders. Open the Action menu in the Move submenu. We'll first cover the ORB, or Orbit command. This command is useful for keeping your ships moving continuously around a target without having to make hard direction changes constantly. Select it now, but don't issue the order yet. This is a two-stage command, just like the formations. The first task is to select the orbit anchor, or the position the ships will travel around. Let's set our anchor near the enemy target. Once you have selected the orbit anchor, we'll determine the radius and the angle of the orbit. Notice that when you change the angle of the sphere widget, a dotted line now appears. The dotted line denotes the actual path that the ships will follow. The arrow near your cursor denotes the direction that they will fall along the path. This is determined by the side of the sphere your cursor is on relative to your ship. Go ahead and issue the order now. Make sure there are no obstacles in the path. The circle will turn red if the ship might hit something in its orbit. Yeah, so if it's if we go out to that far, it's going to hit the asteroid. Bring it to about there. If you want, you can open fire on the target you're orbiting to see how your guns will behave. If I want. <laughs> Engaging. And he didn't open fire. The real utility of the orbit command is that it keeps your ships moving while keeping a side facing the target on the inside, allowing most weapons a good angle at the target. If you just drive a course, you'll eventually have to turn your ships around, or you'll lose the target behind an obstacle, or just slowly start to mask certain weapons as the angle increases. This will cost you valuable time while the turrets swing around. Orbits help prevent this. The downside, of course, is that your ships will be exposing the same armor to the enemy constantly, allowing them to whittle it down before they lay in heavy munitions. You'll also be presenting a good angle for radar returns, meaning you might be an easier target. They've done that, yeah, okay. Targeting a position. Ah. What is tracking? Oh, well, let's lock that. Not within effective range, Commander. 
block that and I want to shift right click weapons. It's firing at a position. How can we help today, Commander? Oh, hold on. Ready. Engaging Is I'm an idiot? I should have been shift right clicking on the target. You can orbit this target as long as you like and play with the weapons. Yes, when we'll you're ready, issue a drive course order to get our ships heading off into open space so we can try the remaining commands. Hey, strap man. Yeah, well, it's it's like the initial early access release, so uh, we'll see. It's very promising looking, though, from my point of view. Like it's elements of um, Homeworld, Next Jupiter Incident, customizability, like Star Sector, things like that. And I want to get more information on the damage module. This guy's in trouble. Yeah, we're only doing the tutorial right now. You can see the gas is leaking as well. It's easy when they don't punch back. Very true. Very true. How can we help today, Commander? Uh, right. So you want to do this? Uh, no, it's just the turn. Orders, Commander. The heading oh, about that way. Roger that. No, I should have shifted right click. Right. Roger that. Oh, not a heading, a drive course. Heading there now. Alright, two more commands to cover. Both are very situational, but you'll be glad you've got them in your tool belt. Better to have it than not have it at all. Okay, good to know they won't fire through each other. Very good to know. Ah, there is a minimum range on these. You can see they're actually punching straight through now. They're firing armor piercing, right? Yeah, he's firing armor piercing, so he's punching right through. Like that. Because they're very uh, expansive. Right. Uh, go. Open the action menu to the move submenu and locate the HDG or heading command. <laughs> the distance you draw the sphere widget out to doesn't matter here, as we're picking a direction instead of a position. Select a direction that is different from the course the formation is currently driving. Notice how the entire formation is turning to face that direction, but continue to move along in its ordered course. A modified movement order like this is indicated with a blue box around the movement status icon. Normally your ships will turn into any course they are following as this allows them to use their main engines and provides the best acceleration. However, when withdrawing under fire, this can expose the main engines, and especially the drive module in the reactor, directly to enemy fire. The hold heading order is useful to keeping the bow pointed towards the enemy, protecting your uh, most vital yes. components during retreat. Okay, so have them hold the heading and then... Or have them move out and then hold the heading. Try to keep the broadside take of the hits. Until you get into a decent range to use your main engines. To cancel a hold heading, as well as the next command we'll talk about, 
Use the CLR or clear command under the move submenu. Clear the heading hold now. Send your traffic. Send your traffic. Cool, but it keeps the course. The last command we'll cover is the ROL or roll command. We'll do this for the ANS small beginnings this time. Select the ship and select the order Send now. Traffic. The roll command will allow you to select a new direction for the ship to use as its up direction. Move the mouse around the widget and click the left mouse button to select a new up direction. Acknowledged. Ordering a ship to roll may seem trivial, but like I've said, your Not radar panels may get taken out by enemy fire. If this is a scout or a spotting ship and it needs to provide targeting data right now, rolling the ship over to expose the functioning panels may be necessary. Cool. Also notice that the small beginnings rolled independently of the guide ship, but is still keeping formation. A roll order can also be cancelled with the clear command. Well, you could do a lot with that, couldn't you? <clears throat> have like five ships in orbit and have them all roll out to a different direction and so on. And well, that's that would be any it good. It may seem but... simple, but if you use any of these little tricks right, you'll start seeing a difference. I'll see you at the academy. Serious potential for yes, there is. That would be the one thing I'd be afraid of is um standing by. I'd be no good at multiplayer because this has been available to um launching missiles. The backers for a while. But there's a bunch of multiplayer videos up on YouTube already. Advanced the missile tactics. <clears throat> Got approval to do advanced missile tutorial. Oh, hello. We have six launchers here. And you get to learn about all sorts of missiles. Out here in the cold void, missiles are like diamonds. They're valuable and scarce, and you won't be able to refill your cells under most circumstances. Unless you want to wind up with empty launchers while your enemy is fully stocked, you'll need to learn how and when to use them. You can always come back here to practice with missiles, but I can also give you a rundown of what you can throw down range. You want to take the reins in practice, or would you like me to guide you through it? I've got plenty of time. Oh, we'll do the instruction, we'll, we'll find out about all the missiles. Wait, we're here. Sounds good. Let's get you familiar with advanced missile operations. The enemy ships in this scenario won't shoot back at your ships, but they are all equipped with different types of point defenses, so it won't be as easy to hit them as last time. Yeah, and intel is pending. Okay. There are five enemy ships in the battle space, but we can only see three of them right now. I've disabled your drives for this, as you'll get the most training out of your current position. No cheating and all that. We'll start by firing two command-guided missiles, the Hurricanes, from the ANS Small Beginnings at the group of two ships directly ahead of us. This is the same as during the weapons trial, except now we're going to test the target's defensive capabilities. As a side note, you can track all missiles with your camera by selecting them, or just hover over them with your mouse and hitting the F key. Missile tube clear. Oh, I fired three there, didn't I? Because I clicked. Don't worry if the missiles get shot down on their way in. The targets have their point defenses on the ventral side of the ships, and since we're below the targets, we're at a disadvantage. He is flak. We could ascend and take the elevated position on the targets, but trust me when I say that they can roll their ships to cover the angle much faster than we can get into a more advantageous position. Send your traffic. You may recall from the weapons trial that I mentioned you can plot complex paths for certain missiles to follow. 
We're going to work up some clever missile strikes. Um, true enough, but then again, the tutorials themselves are broken into smaller missions. So it's not too bad, you can just repeat them, you know? Uh, we're going to work on some clever missile strikes. The easiest way to lay in missile paths is in the tactical view. Toggle it with the space bar and keep it up. We'll need the extra space. God. In the weapons trial, we were always using track mode and in one case visual mode to target our weapons. Some weapons, and especially missiles, also have a position mode that lets us directly choose points in space to shoot at. Well, you would imagine that um, if there is a story campaign later on, it'll be part of the first few missions as well. Because the Hurricane missiles rely on a constant sensor track from their launching ship, they can't be shot at positions. So let's switch over to the Dusty Tome, which is carrying Thunderheads. To target the weapons in position mode, open the action menu by right-clicking in open space. Don't right-click on a track, as this will put the weapons in track mode. Open the weapons list by clicking the Weps or Weapons button on the right side of the action menu. From the list, select the SGM-206 Thunderhead, but don't confirm a launch order just yet. You'll recognize the sphere widget from when we used it briefly in some of the previous trials, but we're going to get a lot of mileage out of it now. There are a few things to notice. The first is the red cone at the cursor location. This represents the missile's seeker field of view. Yeah. When the missile reaches its last waypoint, its seeker will activate and any target in that cone will be locked on by the missile. Yeah, it's so important we're to remember that the up. missile seeker and Come warhead down. are inactive until it reaches the last waypoint. Because of this, it's important to leave space between where you place the last waypoint and the intended target. A good buffer will allow the missile to correct its course and establish a good path to intercept the target. The next thing you'll notice is the dotted lines and the circles projected onto the surface of the sphere. These are present because we're currently holding several enemy tracks on our sensors. It's very easy to get fooled by perspective in 3D space. These tracks are projected onto the sphere, so you have a good point of reference for the direction the tracks relative to your cursor. Like the most that. effective way to aim at your target correctly is to look at its projection on the sphere, not the target itself. Yeah. Before we get to the complicated stuff, just try firing a single missile at the group of two ships by positioning the cursor inside one of their projected circles and clicking the left mouse button. Firing a missile. Unless you're extremely lucky, this missile will likely be shot down on its way in. Point defenses are no joke. Now let's use cruise missiles to their full advantage by laying a path that attacks these ships from the top, where they have no point defense coverage. Uh, I changed course there and threw them off for a second. Right. Start up another missile order, and I'll walk you through creating a path and taking multiple shots in the same order. We're going to arrange a top-down attack using Thunderhead missiles. Remember to be in the tactical view to get the most information and see the projected lines. In order to help you out for this one, I'll place markers for the waypoints we'll use. You place waypoints just how you would with ships. Position the cursor in the vicinity of waypoint 1, and hold the left shift key while clicking the left mouse button to add the waypoint. Don't worry about being exact. Anywhere in the vicinity will work. Now do the same for waypoint two. If you find it helpful, you can lay in your own path to reach the elevation we need to land a good hit. Yeah, and it does. Now comes the trick. Oh, no, 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 no. You want to no, fire no. four did missiles down on top of these ships. In order to do so, position the target circle so it's facing the targets. Then, hold left control to draw the radius out until it's about halfway between your last waypoint and the target. Uh, Remember there. to give some relief space between the selected oh, positions. I left clicked, I didn't shift so left click. Has time to activate. Take your time and remember to reference your cursor against the projected circles, not the tracks themselves. When you're ready to start placing shots, so I want to move in like that. And click the left mouse button. One yep. missile will be fired per click when the order is finally issued. I recommend spreading the shots out in a cone a few degrees across so the salvo has better odds of finding the target. An added benefit of this is that when missiles acquire a target, They'll curve back in on a trajectory that naturally confuses any point defenses they may encounter. To issue the order, <laughs> either yeah. click the left mouse button with the left alt key released, or press the enter key if you have queued up exactly the number of missiles you want. We'll wait till you score a hit on one of these two ships before proceeding. 
want to go out to there. And then I want to bring that in, right? So I want to add one to four. Do like that. Should be right. Don't worry if you don't get any hits. Just try again. It's not like these things are expensive. This is why I would get wrecked in multiplayer. <laughs> and then they're going active. Now we're talking. Oh, they missed. They're going to come back around, right? Nope. No, they're gone. They're seeking in that direction. They didn't have enough uh, lead time to turn. Attacking ships from gotcha. top bye, and bye, bottom bye. limits the number of mounts that can defend against the attack. It also has the added benefit of increasing the surface area of the vital internal components which are exposed to your fire, meaning more damage is more likely to be done once the missile connects. I'll be honest, Commander. I made you do this one the hard way, so you could get some practice with a sphere widget on a target you could see. You can also accomplish the same thing using target reference points, which you can find under the signal menu as the TRP button. Hmm. We won't do it now, but feel free to practice on your own later. It'll allow you to create a single waypoint for some missiles to travel via when firing on a track, but keep in mind that not all missiles support this. Let's move on to another type of missile. ANS Fatal Spell is carrying a few SGM-233 Gale semi-active guided missiles. Semi-active missiles have a passive seeker and require an illuminator to home in on a target. Think of this like a radar flashlight. The illuminating signal can be provided by any ship, not just the ship that launched the missile. But that signal must be painted on a target for a missile to home in on it. Without it, the missile is just an expensive dud. The benefit of semi-active missiles is that they are significantly harder to jam or decoy because a ship can output much more energy than a missile can. Illuminators can be found in the action menu under the EW weapon list on the right hand side. Illuminate a target. Roger that command. Your Plus illuminator has a 90 second firing time before it turns off so the amplifiers can cool down. You can see it's kind of effect in the tactical view. Gotcha. Before it cools down, fire four Gale missiles at the target you have illuminated. And they're not just randomly firing out of every battery, they're obviously all in that battery. Remember, if the illumination signal turns off before the missiles arrive, they will lose tracking and probably miss their target. They'll continue in their current direction, so stationary targets may be struck, but at this point, it's just luck. A lot of damage there. Illuminators also require a direct line of sight to their target. Ships obscured by asteroids won't be painted. Now let's get some more practice with using waypoint paths. There are two more enemy ships hiding in the radar shadows of the nearby asteroids. There's a decent bit to the EOR, yeah. <clears throat> you might have missed that. We did the EOR a little earlier. 
Another benefit of cruise missiles and their ability to follow past is that you can shoot at targets you suspect to be in the area but do not hold a track on. This is good for hitting ships that have retreated behind an asteroid or other obstacle hiding from our sensors. Yeah, and then they follow the cone. So like, um, the surface area showing to radar affects your signature. Also having ships nearby and systems on affects your signature and so on. And then there's active EOR as well. Use the thunderheads on any of the ships to hit the target That's hiding near the point I've indicated. Remember to use the tactical view to give yourself the best perspective, and lay in your path so the missiles will turn on their seekers before reaching the target. They'll need time and space to identify a target. Okay. More thunderheads. Actually, remember to hold shift. Oh, we went too far. Hold on a sec. Oh, God damn it. <laughs> okay, let's do that again. Shift is my worst enemy right now. Hiding behind asteroids can help you remain hidden from the enemy, and also gives the attacker an advantage. Cover can be a double-edged sword at the worst of times. By hugging the asteroid closely with your missile's flight plats, you can give the point defenses less time to react before they detect the threats. That means less distance the missiles have to travel through defensive fire. <laughs> it's all too much. Um, it's one of those things, right? When you first look at it, it's going to be completely confusing. But I think once you get into it, it it'll become like a second nature if you're doing it a lot. Yeah, this is this is advanced missile stuff. But you should be tracking. Have I played Deadlock? I haven't played it. I know of it. Good strike! There's one more ship hiding up near Point Boxer, above the large asteroid. For this one, I'll hide the marker after a few seconds. So get a good feel of for where it is. This will be your hardest shot yet, so make me proud. Uh, what now? Oh, it's way up there. Oh yeah, no, I, I know of the game. I know of the game, yeah. 
got you five by five. So, just the tome, weapons, thunderhead. I'm gonna go a decent distance, but I wanna go. I want it up here. Let's focus on you. I think that's right. Yeah, that's right there. <sighs> okay, let's do that again. I won't say a damn thing. I'm late this party. How is it and what do we think? Uh, I'm liking it so far. Complex is good. Especially in this day and age. Uh, let's get that chat box. Oh, shift. Draw that in. And then we want to go like this, right? Yeah, it's uh, I think I want it. Like that. Outgoing missile. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's a thing. Okay. Gotta hit him too. Oof. Send traffic. Hmm. Chief engineer is gonna be salty. Yeah, he is. At the ready, commander. Okay, then do I want to do something way too complex for what I'm trying to do? Send the missiles out. On a flat trajectory. Go about there. Then go up to here. Oh yeah, exactly. And smart commanders, don't forget to <laughs> smart commanders. And then I want to bring... Go and bring that into a bit there. But under the asteroid? True. But we have plenty of missiles. Missile out. 
Oh no, they're way above. We were oh, in the right area. Down. I just don't want them to hit the ship. I want to hit my ship. Uh, sorry, the visible targets are below the rock. We're trying to hit a target that we can't see, and she's after deleting the waypoint. So it's as if we did a sensor sweep. And we know its position, but we've lost it actively. But it's around... Oh god, did I send them the wrong way? Oh, did they go up? Oh my god. Okay. Right, I need to get used to that because <laughs> I'm doing that all wrong. You have thunderheads. So I thought I had them placed right that they were going down there, but they, were, they obviously weren't. They were going off in the other direction altogether. You do have thunderheads, right. We're going to get this. Yeah, we're coming up to about here. And I'll eventually remember to click shift. Go a little bit further. Then I want to do this. Okay, and they are definitely in the correct manner in which I want them, right? Yeah, they're coming back down. We are going to hit this damn ship. Send the last one over here. Missile away. Is there a way of delaying the missile sensor activation? Um, that wasn't mentioned, so no idea. Oh, sorry, their sensor activation doesn't. The sensor doesn't activate until the end of the waypoints. So you want to have the waypoints. Um, <clears throat> Ending up facing the general direction of the enemy you want to hit. Or did I go too far to that side? Yeah, oh I did. I went way too far. He's over here. Oh my god, so close. Okay, so he's in that little nook there. Receiving. How many missiles have we got left? 20. Well then. So 
So we're firing him out to here. Extending that, firing them up here. Bringing that back in. And he's in this little nook here. Missile reserves are low. <laughs> when you want their memory to die. Yeah. Also, is it a cruiser? Definitely not heavier armament. Yep, there he is. Shooting him down as they're going up, so that's bad. We Excellent hit him. Work, Commander. I don't care. We hit him. Oh, like a salvo? Yeah, firing off as a salvo would be nice. I don't know, is the answer. So attacking him from like the back rear there would have been better. That does it for your advanced missile ops. Standing you can come back whenever you feel you need practice. Obviously, I can go through all of this again, but I think you have it under control. I do recommend practicing the missile paths. When you lay these in accurately and quickly in the midst of battle, you'll be a serious threat in the battle space. Ready. I'll see you back at the academy. Ah. Missile tube clear. Sending it. We've burned our chaff as well, look. We're running out of missiles. So that is the tutorial. Yeah, we went through the uh, electronic warfare earlier. Let's go into the fleet editor. The standard frigate that we were using. And we have a choice of the weapons and so on. So the MLS is a roll-off missile launcher loaded by crew members who retrieve munitions from bulk magazines. Gotcha. For a volley of four. That, that can fire a volley, right? And then because these are... What are we using? We're using this here. 
Just come missile platform found in this. Allow for mix and match mission profile. But the ease of use for loading the cells, delicate task can only be completed in port. Yeah, vertical launch, multiple, multiple launch, yeah. Gotcha. Um, cancel that. That's the basic hull that we were using. Which was the reins, right? Yeah, that's the reins. Got the Sprinter Corvette. Like cruiser, is that what we bombarded? No, it was a heavy cruiser. Or yeah, Titan esque, yeah. And the Solomon. Uh. Get rid of these for a second. We'll load up some templates if they're there. Let's see what. Uh... Oh, wait, really? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay, there's only that template there. I guess in the long range weaponry in game is railguns? I would imagine so. Railguns. No ammunition. There's 14 mounts. Do like a random skirmish and get wrecked. 